I'm Sharon Omoza from Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, welcome to this session on Open Street Map and the Neglected Pedestrian by Eduardo Nihut. Uh, the session is going to take 20 minutes with the Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening from around the world, hopefully. I don't know where you're tuning in from, but I'm very glad to have you here. And today's topic is about OpenStreetMap and the neglected pedestrian. My name is Eduardo, and I'm going to be looking at it through a personal lens. I'm just very interested in pedestrian data. I wanted to explore what it looks like around the world. Uh, apologies for the catchy title, neglected pedestrian, I just thought. Might be a bit grandiose, but it, it's got an element of truth too. And I hope that you will see that as we go through the topic today. In my day job, I'm working within Facebook focused on Mapillary, which is street level imagery. And I, if you're familiar with OpenStreetMap, which obviously many of you are, you've probably seen Mapillary in some of the ways it can support contributions to OpenStreetMap. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but mainly focused today on pedestrian data and OpenStreetMap and what we can do to make it better. You can see the agenda here. If you're interested, just pause it and uh, take a look at the structure of the talk. But I'm going to move on as I think a lot of it's pretty self-explanatory. And I wanted to start by going back, going back to the start of kind of the modern era of digital maps as we know it. And some of you might be disappointed to see Google Maps on the side here in the OpenStreetMap presentation. But I think if we're honest, Google Maps has had a big impact on web maps, digital maps, the industry as a whole. And you can see just how much, how, what a long way it's come since they started uh, in the digital map space. They were one of the pioneers for a lot of things um, and really kind of taking what we had traditionally in a thick book uh, that you might put under the back of your car or uh, that you might print out via web pages and putting that online. But from a very car centric perspective, and that's what kind of got me thinking uh, was why do I feel that pedestrian data has been neglected thus far and um, actually play, taking a closer look at some of the reasons why, why that might be, if it's true in the first place. And that took me back to these early days where if you think about where a lot of the initial mapping efforts took place, it was around a car-centric premise, getting from A to B and using a, a car to do so. You see here maps on the right, another great company when it comes to car navigation. A lot of you might have their sat nav in your actual vehicle. They uh, have been doing this for years. They're very good at it uh, as well as Google. But again, the emphasis here is on traveling along a road, which uh, from a vehicle centric point of view. If we go back uh, as well, if we're still kind of looking at probably late 90s maybe sometime in the early 2000s if you were like me you might have printed off paper maps and i found this very exciting back in the day whether it was MapQuest or google being able to print off turn by turn directions and have them in the car rather than having to get out that big book and finding a grid reference this was a very uh, easy way or so it seemed at the time way to get from a to b there are apps like MapQuest app here which is getting panned by cnet but uh, still a major step forward when you think about what predetermined it. But pedestrian data was lacking, and I, I wanted to look at OpenStreetMap in particular. What was it like in OpenStreetMap? And so going through the archives on, open, on the OpenStreetMap wiki, I found this story of a mapping initiative in the Isle of Wight back in 2006, if I'm not mistaken. Um, some of you might have even been there. And the interesting thing about that was if you were doing a mapathon back then and you went out with a group of people and you mapped an area, you were basically taking a blank map and contributing to it uh, and having something pretty substantial at the end, which you could be proud of. Of course, now it's you, you're kind of filling in the blanks, but this was, was that early contribution. A lot of it, once again, very road centric because that was a lot of the thinking around what a map would be useful for. And indeed, open street map, in the name itself suggests it's a map of streets rather than uh, not necessarily cycleways and paths and hiking trails. Of, of course, it's evolved to be so much more. So as I was thinking about this topic, I put out a tweet to see, you know, would people be interested in 
allocating more of their city's budget to a particular mode of transport. And I guess my my personal feeling here was that pedestrian data was and pedestrian infrastructure was sorely underrepresented. And I was curious to see if other people would feel the same way. Usually when you include a tweet like this in a presentation, you're including a tweet that very much supports the rest of your presentation. But I thought this was interesting that a lot of people feel that, in fact, cycling and, and um, public transport is, is more important. I definitely agree that those two are very important things, and it's probably not a binary thing. We, I think all of these areas beyond roads, which no one voted for here, need support. But only uh, pedestrians, pedestrians only got two votes. One of them might have been me. The other could be my mum, although hopefully she's not on Twitter yet. <laughs> but um, I think the overall picture here is that roads are not very popular. Uh, public transport, cycling, and hopefully pedestrian infrastructure will get more attention from, from government to make cities more livable. How am I approaching this topic? Well, I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I took five cities from different parts of the world, different sizes and populations, differing approaches to urban planning, varying topographies, culturally different, and kind of very, uh, very fun for me is that I'm familiar with each of them. So, I thought that would be a good starting point. I took the city of Folsom in the United States, which is where I live now, Heidelberg in Germany, which we're at in the last physical state of the map, 2019, a wonderful city, Melbourne, Australia, which is where I was born and um, have spent a lot of my life, Stonetown in Tanzania, which is a, another fantastic city with quite a thriving open street map community, um, been lucky to go there a couple of times. And then Yesan in South Korea, where my wife is from, and that's a country town a few hours south of Seoul. And so with this selection of cities, I was asking the questions, well, one, what type of pedestrian data has been added to OpenStreetMap in each of these areas? And two, how closely does it match the reality on the ground? I began by downloading a data set for each of the areas, and this involved compiling just a, a simple query in Overpass that included a range of uh, tags that I thought were relevant for pedestrian mapping. I built an initial list, and then I asked my colleagues, was there anything missing? And they pointed out that I should probably be considering, considering areas as well, and they had a few tag suggestions there, uh, and a few extra suggestions on tags for line strings. And, and that was really helpful. We built out kind of this, this list that we have here, but I'm really curious, is there anything that we're missing here that might be relevant for building a, a sense of what pedestrian information is available in OpenStreetMap for a particular area? With that, we could then put it into QGIS. And I looked at uh, the five cities. Uh, you can see Melbourne here, very easy to visualize. You can see the points which represent, you know, highway equals crossing line strings, which are probably failed at cartographically here. They're very hard to see. They're kind of the uh, light orangey color and uh, areas as well. And then with the app attribute table in QGIS, you can then query each of the individual nodes or the areas of line strings and see what tags are associated. So on the left here, you see what is a line string, highway equals cycleway. On the right, you see highway equals crossing. So that is a node and you can explore a bunch of these um, that you've downloaded. And so I did just that for each of the cities. And I'd like to walk you through in the time that I have some of the things I found for each of the cities, what's in OpenStreetMap, and then how that compares to my understanding of that city. Here we have Folsom, as I mentioned, this is where I'm living now, quintessential suburbia. And what I found fascinating when I moved to Folsom, and this was actually one of the catalysts for, for the idea behind this presentation, is that the pedestrian infrastructure can be so good, particularly in residential areas like this with wide sidewalks on both sides of the roads and they're well signposted and they've got clearly marked crossings. And then they just disappear and you're stuck crossing a six lane highway. Uh, and often you just don't wanna do that in the first place. The pedestrian infrastructure just ends and the reason behind that is because they don't expect anyone to walk, people are gonna drive. Even within, Commercial centers, they can have great pedestrian infrastructure that just ends and then all of a sudden you find yourself, even though you're only traveling 200 meters, having to get in your car if you, if you are actually wanting to cross in a safe way. So that's the reality on the ground. In OpenStreetMap, we see tags like highway equals footway, uh, highway equals path, 
the cycleways and paths in parks are generally really well mapped. Some of the stuff around commercial areas is well mapped. You can see a lot of the nodes, highway equals crossing are mapped, of course, because people are mapping roadways as almost a first priority in many cases. But then a lot of the pedestrian infrastructure in residential areas is missing. So that's a big area of improvement needed for Folsom in the United States. We now look at Heidelberg. You can see the map here for the old part of Heidelberg is a lot more dense. And Heidelberg's, I think, fairly well known as a pretty pedestrian friendly city. And I definitely found that like the public transport is great. The cycling infrastructure is great. And it's very easy to walk around, um, especially where it's not too hilly. This is the city, as I mentioned, 2019 state of the map, great open street map community. They, the university there was a team behind the open route service. So that explains probably why a lot of the, a lot of the infrastructure here is also well mapped. The tags here of interest, um, highway equals steps, I guess, you, which you don't see too much in Folsom. They used a lot of sidewalk equals both or right or left, which indicates whether the sidewalk is to the left or the right of the road or on both sides, but is not actually the um, actual individual way demarcating the sidewalk. But they also did a lot of uh, mapping of the individual sidewalks as well. Overall, just a much more complete picture of the rally on the ground. And the cool thing in Heidelberg is they also had other tags like lit equals yes, the smoothness and the surface type to just paint a more accurate picture, a clearer, more detailed picture of what it would be like to be a pedestrian in a given part of the city. Now to Melbourne, my home city, the downtown area, the CBD you see here is actually really well mapped. Uh, it's got good pedestrian infrastructure as well, wide open sidewalks, which it's had for 150 years. One of the benefits of being a lot younger than a European city. And you see a lot of highway equals crossing around. A lot of the parks have very well mapped uh, infrastructure, some gaps. And this is one of those things where it, the gaps actually do reflect a gap in public transport, uh, sorry, pedestrian infrastructure, where there are major highways crossing through here, which disrupts the ease of a pedestrian traveling from this busy skyscraper kind of downtown area to the residential area down here. But there are still gaps missing. You can see like a lot of the residentials down here in the southeast in South Yarra, Cremorne, they're missing pedestrian data. So more work to be done, but, but in pretty good shape. They also used uh, lit equals yes, smoothness, surface. And an interesting point about Melbourne is there is a lot of areas. Areas equals yes, which indicates squares where pedestrians uh, are able to gather. And I thought that was not something I'd thought of prior to this project, but I thought it was interesting to, to see cities around the world which have large areas demarcated for pedestrians. Speaking of which, takes us to Stonetown Zandibar, beautiful city, uh, Stonetown is actually the old part of Zanzibar city, which is in uh, Tanzania and very pedestrian friendly. And part of the reason is because you just can't get a car through these narrow old streets, even if you wanted to, that you sometimes see these Vespers traveling through, but really great city if you're a pedestrian, uh, a beautiful place to explore. And they've mapped really well a lot of these old routes as pedestrian, um, highway equals pedestrian. They also have areas, as I mentioned, demarcated for pedestrians. The only gap really missing here, I think, is um, it's quite significant is this section here of, of the suburban areas. Um, a lot of these roads up here, they do have sidewalks that haven't been mapped. So I think the next kind of initiative would be mapping beyond the old downtown area. And there is good 360 imagery contributed by Federico to help do that. The last city is Yesan. For me, this was the most interesting. As I mentioned, this is where my wife was from originally, and there was actually nothing there in, as far as pedestrian infrastructure, uh, sorry, as far as it's mapped in OpenStreetMap. And I added a couple of things. There's a lot of work to do though. I need to capture more imagery to help with that process. Satellite imagery is not very good. Even the actual base map data, the, the roads themselves are often completely out of date. So plenty of work to be done in this town, which is actually quite fun. It probably harkens back to the early days of OpenStreetMap, which unfortunately I, I missed. But yeah, as I said, a lot of work to do here, not much really to comment on as far as existing data because it, it needs to be added in the first place. The sidewalk data, uh, the, the actual reality of the sidewalks, a lot of the time you're walking 
on quiet residential streets that might not have a sidewalk, but they're pretty safe. So that'll be an interesting one to map. There are some areas that, that do have sidewalks, the commercial areas, for example, they could be ma mapped as individual line strings. So here's my um, very unscientific starring method, just from my own personal opinion of what each city has achieved as far as open street map relative to the reality on the ground. And so that's on the left um, in this middle column here. So Folsom, I think a lot of work needs to be done to actually match the reality in open street map. So two stars for Folsom. Infrastructure, excellent in some places, terrible in others. So putting it right in the middle on three stars. Heidelberg, four stars, really good um, mapping efforts by the community there. Uh, so four stars in open street map, phenomenal public transport infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure and cycling infrastructure. I'm grading the pedestrian infrastructure, of course, five stars for that. Melbourne, open street map, quite a few significant suburbs missing. Where it is mapped, it's mapped well. So giving it three stars there. The infrastructure itself, though, is, is pretty excellent across the board. A lot of sidewalks. Uh, it's just certain parts of the city that are lacking, but overall, very good uh, pedestrian infrastructure. Same thing with at least the old part of Stonetown, the old part of Zanzibar City. Four stars, great place for a pedestrian. Um, uh, so sorry, three stars, great place for a pedestrian. But the the connections with the old uh, between the old part of the city and the new part of the city are lacking. So more effort needs to be done to map um, some of that 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 aspect. But overall, like everything in the old part of the town is is mapped. Um, hopefully, we see improvements to like if you look at some of the, the newer parts of the city, there's like great sidewalk infrastructure and then they'll have potholes or they'll have construction going on. Uh, so so that's why the infrastructure there got three stars. Yes, son, one star for open street map, basically nothing there. And two stars for the infrastructure. It's, it's not the best place to be a pedestrian. Luckily, it's quiet. But uh, by mapping this in open street map, hopefully we can paint a much better picture of what needs to be done. So it might bring us to the question of where is the data? And my theory is that there's three reasons why we're missing pedestrian data relative to a lot of the other data within OpenStreetMap, such as um, anything automotive related. And that's one is the commercial incentives were less significant. And this is no criticism of companies uh, in this space. A lot of the companies that have like traditionally made maps companies uh, like Tom Tom and him apps a lot of their customers were were in the automotive space or either directly or loosely so shell of course very dependent on the automotive industry you got companies like Mercedes which actually part own here companies like Toyota all these companies are fueling developments uh, in navigation and so that actually fed into a lot of the early web mapping efforts which Google then took on and which I think also influenced some of the thinking in OpenStreetMap originally. So that was reason number one. Reason number two is that because of that initial commercial incentive, I think there's an inertia here where a lot of the collection methods that developed were car-centric. People were getting street-level imagery, they were getting, they had engineers sitting in the car surveying uh, different attributes that they would drive past, but all from the point of view of someone sitting in a vehicle or a sensor equipment setting, sitting in a vehicle and this means that you miss some of what a pedestrian would see. And so we need to shift thinking to use some other tools if we want to fill in the, the gap that we've just identified of pedestrian data. The last thing, and this is a challenge for us as a community to overcome, is that it's just a lot harder to collect pedestrian data at scale. You can't drive 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour. You have to, you have to uh, find other ways to go about collecting it. Jari here is she's collecting with the Mapillary app using her smartphone. Uh, she mapped her university with street level imagery, not necessarily scalable across the entire company if she's doing it on her own. So we need a lot more people contributing imagery. Uh, same story with satellite imagery here. This is Yesan, and you can see the Bing aerial imagery. Like even though I knew there was a trail here, it was very hard for me to map with Bing aerial imagery. Maxar Premium is a bit better but still not as clear through forest canopies, especially in the summertime when there's more of a forest canopy to know where exactly that trail is. And so that's where something like a GPX track would be useful. So what can we do? This is a, 
stair, set of stairs, as you can see, in Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. This is a great path for pedestrians because it saves them a lot of time. Cars have to actually take a lot longer to get from the top of this hill to the bottom, uh, whereas a pedestrian can cut straight through. But it's not necessarily the best for someone who's mobility impaired, potentially someone who's older or someone who's in a wheelchair. So if they were using an app that relied on OpenStreetMap, I'm not sure that they would have the best data to be able to know whether this was a great path or not. So one thing we could do is map it in Mapillary, capture street level imagery, that'll be uploaded uh, and then feed into ID Editor and Jossum, which we can use to fill in additional details. Super easy, takes not long at all to map a, a set of stairs like this. Street Complete, which is actually a tool I love very much, an app I love very much. Unfortunately, it's on Android only at the moment. And uh, the thing I love about it is just how easy it is to, as a baseline for contributing additional data, particularly around things like pedestrian data. Um, here are some of the tasks, some of the quests that you can see. Does this sidewalk, ha does this street have a sidewalk? You can put left, right, both sides. How many steps does uh, this area have uh, on, on the right-hand side here? Does this set of steps have a handrail? what's the surface type of this road. All of this is really useful for routing purposes and different routing engines can rank it accordingly, but a great tool to very quickly build up a, a picture of an area. We have GoMap, which is a wonderful iOS-based editing platform. You can actually do a lot of what you would imagine in ID Editor or, or in uh, Jossum, but it's just mobile friendly. A very cool tool if you just want to add points of interest, or in this case, pedestrian data, like where the location of a handrail, uh, whether it's got tactile paving, um, all these kind of things. And then there's Vespucci, a fantastic Android app, which is also very powerful for a mobile editor. It's incredible what you can actually collect without touching a laptop these days. And very much the same principle as GoMap here, but uh, Android centric. So some of my, uh, before we get to questions, I do want to shout out to a few people who and organizations have been doing a lot of great work in this space. There's Liga Petanal, uh, which is based in Mexico. They've been doing fantastic work thinking about how do you make a city more suitable for pedestrians? How do we get government thinking about that and not just uh, just um, working on the kind of automotive side of things? You have uh, Wheelmap, which is based in Germany. They do great work, particularly around accessibility. And then there's Open Sidewalks, which has been doing great work about thinking how do we create a standard for mapping sidewalks. US-centric, this organization, I think based out of the University of Washington in, in Washington State. But a lot of this, I think, can, can be applied more broadly and they're questions that we all want to be asking ourselves. How can we collectively map pedestrian infrastructure? So what... Is the state of pedestrian infrastructure like in your area? What are you mapping? Where are you mapping and why are you mapping? These are some questions I'd love to discuss with you in the Q&A or on Twitter or wherever else we may connect. I thank you very much for listening and I hope you can connect with us at MapFlurry. We have a great Telegram group full of lively discussions on, of course, MapFlurry, but also other stuff like the topics we've been talking about today. You can contact us via support at mapflurry.zendesk.com. Or if you want to reach me directly, I'm on Twitter at eNearHeart, LinkedIn, uh, GitHub, and I'm also uh, accessible via email. So really hoping to hear from you. I'm so glad that you could attend this talk remotely. I hope we can do it face-to-face -face in the near future and looking forward to seeing what you're thinking about when it comes to pedestrian mapping. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo, for, for the talk. I will head to the to the questions. Uh, our first question here is: um, Do you want to say OpenStreetMap haven't been haven't had a big impact? Sorry, can you just repeat that one, Sharon? Uh, someone is asking: Like, do you want to say OpenStreetMap haven't had a big impact? Uh, I think there's a point where you give credit to Google Maps. Yeah, so that's the question. Uh. So I, I was very much talking about the the era prior to OpenStreetMap. So like pre two thousand, like in the early days of OpenStreetMap, where it was um, web mapping 
was still kind of developing where paper maps were kind of printed off the internet and then used. And I think it's fair to say like the majority of people back then were not using OpenStreetMap, they were using other tools. And I think that that thinking influenced um, a way a lot of people initially thought about web mapping. So of course, OpenStreetMap over the last 15 years has had an enormous impact. That's why I love OpenStreetMap so much. But I was just trying to understand why even within OpenStreetMap, there's not as much emphasis on pedestrian mapping. I think that's changing, but there's still been, with a lot of mapping um, technologies, a very car-centric approach. And, and so that's kind of what I was trying to explore. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, there is another question on uh, with the data you have collected and analyzed, do you think it's possible to give cities an OSM pedestrian data quality score? Uh, yeah, definitely. I've actually had a few interesting conversations with people that are doing it. This, there are organizations like far um, more ahead on this than kind of my own thinking, but. Some are taking into account kind of the width of sidewalks. Some are taking into account um, the service type already. They're using existing OpenStreetMap tags to, to develop scoring systems and algorithms. Um, I think the tricky thing is, is more so than some other areas of OpenStreetMap, there's a big inconsistency between countries in, in how we map. So in Australia, for example, I don't think we have any um, we haven't got to a stage of consensus yet on terms of how to map sidewalks. So sometimes we just have a tag that says there's a sidewalk on one side of the road or the other. Uh, I know in the US there's open sidewalks initiatives that's actually trying to standardise the way we map a sidewalk. I'm hoping to see initiatives like that more, more globally where it just makes it easier for people who are developing algorithms and walkability scores to apply um, these scores in different areas. I actually had a chat with someone who's who's done this a few days ago and they were saying they've got this model um it's called the acronym is goat um i can't remember what it stands for i think it's like general something on accessibility and transport but um that their problem was that their model worked really great in I think, munich which was where they started it and then they applied it to uh colombia i think they applied it to mexico as well and it required a bit of tweaking to get that walkability score working properly. So I think if we had more standardization in sidewalk mapping, a model like that might work better globally. But um, I think that's normal for anything in OpenStreetMap. You always need to customize it a bit for the local environment. Uh, great. We also have another question on uh, how active is the local community in ESAN in mapping? Uh, if not very active, like do do you know why and how how can you improve that? Uh, will apps like open uh, like Street Complete help? Yeah, I love that question. So OpenStreetMap in Korea is just generally very underdeveloped, and the reason like Korea is a fascinating place when it comes to consumer technology. Pretty much like anything that you can think of that we have like in the West, the big tech companies, they have their own equivalent. So I, most people use Samsung, of course, or LG. They use Naver as their search engine. They use Naver Maps to, to navigate, which is a bit like the Google Maps. And it's actually a very impressive um, piece of technology. They use Kakao chat to communicate with one another. It's kind of like WhatsApp and, and Facebook. Um, rolled into one. So OpenStreetMap still has a long way to go there. I, I, there's a Telegram group that's got uh, quite a few Koreans in it, which is great, um, along with a lot of Telegram bots, but I encourage you to join. I think we have a ratio of about like one bot to one person at the moment, so it'd be great to have more people in there. But um, they're discussing some of this. There's a lot of, as I said there, like, yes, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. Street Complete would help, but I think also like, Maybe microgrants is something here where we folk, uh, when COVID's kind of winding down, we can have more meetups to support the Korean community. And next time I visit, I, I hope to arrange a meetup actually and get a few people uh, attending and, and talking about some of the things that the country could address first. But that, that's up to them, right? It's what, what they determine is most important. Oh, thank you. That's great. Uh, the other question is um, 
pedestrian mapping relates to public transport mapping uh, because every journey begins and the ends as a pedestrian journey. How do you see the relationship between these two modes? Yeah, that's that's a really smart question. I agree with that entirely. You know, if you're already making the decision to take public transport, I think the majority of the time you're you're going to be walking there in the first place, um, with some exceptions, but mostly walking. So the two are inextricably linked. And I think the same is also true for a lot of commercial activity. Like let's say you're going to the shops in most parts of the world. And this is why I found the US like really interesting because it's quite different here. Whenever I want to go somewhere here, unfortunately I need to hop in the car, just as the nature of where I live. I think New York and San Francisco might be different, but here it's very car centric. Whereas back home, I used to walk to the supermarket, walk to the local cafe, uh, and, and so I think in particularly cities like um, like Melbourne or Yesan, where you do a lot of walking, you want to have that mapped as, as well as possible for, uh, for that purpose in like engaging with businesses. Um, and then from the public transport point of view as well, like to see if there are deficiencies, if it is hard to get to your bus stop. If we map it, then we're much better able to articulate to local government that there's a deficiency here that needs to be addressed. So. In a lot of these occasions, if it's not mapped, it's hard for us to understand as kind of end users of these, this infrastructure, which makes it even harder to communicate with government about what needs to change. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other question is on um, could Mapillary incorporate individual photos contributed by pedestrian in its less accurate drive by imagery? Um, might have to check that question. Just let me have a look. Can you repeat that while I, I'm just trying to find it? Uh, the question was about pedestrian um, imagery in Mapillary, and then I didn't get the second part. Yeah, the question asks if, uh, like, could Mapillary incorporate individual photos contributed by pedestrians in its less accurate drive by imagery? Yeah, I think uh, we definitely encourage more of that. Uh, part of that is the product itself, like the actual the apps themselves, making it easier to contribute images like that. And uh, so I think I'd love to see more pedestrian-centric capture. We haven't seen much of that um, relative to the ratio of, of, of driver capture. And I think one thing that might help is like, 360 cameras are getting um, cheaper. So whether it's a single image or a series of images, um, at least now with 360 imagery, it's easier to walk down the street and very quickly get the entire panorama. They're much cheaper and easier to use than they used to be just a couple of years ago, higher resolution. So we're going to be announcing um, some stuff around that. People might remember the camera grant program, aiming to get that up and running again so the people who aren't interested in capturing pedestrian Infrastructure can can do that, uh, but single images and, and pedestrian images are definitely something you'll see us encouraging. And that's, I guess, um, something I'd love to connect with people after this if you have ideas there on, on how we could do that better. Uh, the last question for you. Uh, will you count accessibility related features such as tactile paving and dropped curves as part of pedestrian infrastructure? or is that more specialized? Oh, 100%, uh, that's definitely included. And I love, I should have mentioned Pick for Review as well. They're another great um, web application that allows you to map this. And you'll see they have this, this concept of missions where you can use street level imagery to answer questions about different types of infrastructure. And so they have questions around, like if you're looking at an image, does this curb have a curb cut so that a wheelchair can get up and down easily? They have questions around whether the pedestrian crossing is marked, whether it has tactile paving. Street Complete features that. So um, shout out to the Street Complete development team for, for incorporating that. I think Tobias was on uh, was on the live stream as well. So great, um, great application for quickly answering questions about tactile paving, which is, 100% related to pedestrian uh, infrastructure. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, Eduardo. And uh, thank you, thank you everyone for joining this session.